<laughs> so I'll start it from the beginning. I'll do a quick introduction, right? So today we are doing, uh, because uh, for those who are on the recording, uh, we are doing Revelation, uh, starting a new series, Revelation, uh, the seals, the seven seals of Revelation. They begin from uh, Revelation chapter four through Revelation chapter eight to verse one, Revelation, Revelation eight verse one. So like I said, this is a view of the study topics that we will be doing. Uh, the first eight study topics basically deal with the with the introductory uh, vision to the seals right now um, there there are also two addendums as you will see uh, to this section in other words additional studies that add that are um, that are added that are related to the chapters that we are uh, that we are going to study that is revelation 4 to revelation 8 chapter 8 verse 1 now, the first addendum is called uh, the Lord is my rock. Mm, and this is concerning what happened on the day of Pentecost, because we, will, we are going to notice as we study that in Revelation chapter four and chapter five, mm, it's really giving us, uh, you have this description of Jesus Christ arriving in heaven to begin his intercessory ministry on the day of Pentecost, right? And so that addendum, the Lord is our rock, helps us to understand a little better what happened when Jesus arrived in heaven, right? So then the second addendum is chain reaction, right? It's called the chain reaction. And that one has to do with the persecutions that started right after the day of Pentecost and continued through the period of the Roman Empire. And that's going to help us to understand a little bit more, particularly the second seal of Revelation chapter six, right? So the, um, the next nine to, um, to, 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 to 16, uh, we, we will spend a lot of time when we are actually going to study the seals. So the first seal is the white horse. The second seal is the red horse. Third seal is the black horse. Uh, fourth is the pale horse. Fifth is seal is the cry of the martyrs. Sixth seal is the sign of the judgment. And then Revelation 7, there is an interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal that introduces the 144,000 and the great multitude, right? Now, the interlude between uh, the sixth and seventh seals uh, deals, as, we, as I said, with the 100, 144,000. And the question is, why is that interpretation or interlude between the, uh, seal number six and seal number seven, right? Then we find that seal number seven is silence in heaven. Now, seal number seven is just one verse, and there's silence in heaven for a space about half an hour, right? Now, I think uh, most of the studies we have done, even what I have done, I don't know about uh, whether you all have done it, uh, use, we used to think this referred to the second coming, right? When Jesus is going to take seven days or we're going to take seven days to travel back to heaven. Uh, uh, that is why it says half an hour. But when you study it clearly from the Bible, uh, you let scripture, uh, interpret scripture and spirit of prophecy, you find that there is a far better explanation, sorry, uh, to that. And we will deal with that in the seventh seal, right? Then um, study seven to 21, uh, deal with the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We look at it from different angles, the different ways uh, at the Sabbath and Sunday issue at the end of time, right? So we have what is God's eschatological seal, end time seal, what's the difference? And then we'll talk about the papacy, the Jesuits and the Sabbath. And then we will discuss the lesson from the forbidden tree, the idle Sabbath, the seal of the living God. Uh, we will discuss those at the end of our study. Now, this is what our study will look like. I have done a little graphic there. As you saw, we did the seven uh, churches. Uh, the first seal is is related, right? Related to the second, the um, first church, 
And the first champet also has a connection to it. You can see the arrows there, right? So Smyrna is the second seal, Pergamum is the third seal, Tatara is the fourth seal, Sardis is the fifth seal, uh, not the entire Sardis, but we will see it belongs to that. And then Philadelphia, and then we have the conclusion of the seven seals, right? The trumpets also fall into the same um, um, time frame. Uh, the fifth trumpet is the French Revolution, we will see. And the sixth trumpet is gathering of the righteous and the wicked, AD um, 1844 to close of probation. And then the seventh trumpet is the close of probation, the everlasting kingdom, which is future. Now, once we finish this series, we will go into the trumpets. Now, one thing that we need to understand uh, about the book of Revelation is um, the chiastic structure of revelation. Now, chiasm is characterized by having or denoting a structure in which uh, one theme is repeated in reverse order. As you can see, I, can, I have color coded it. Um, revelation 1 to uh, Revelation 1, 11 is a prologue. Then you get an epilogue, which is Revelation 22, 6 to 21, right? So they are the beginning and the end of the book. Then you go, the next one is the church militant. It's the seven churches that we did, uh, Revelation 1, 12 to uh, Revelation 3, 22. Then you get Revelation triumphant, Revelation 21, 5 to 22, 22, 5. So you get the militant and triumphant, right? So you get the, this in, in the book of Revelation. Then you have uh, God's uh, work for mankind's salvation which is in progress, that is from what we are doing now, chapters of, um, four, one to chapter eight, one, right? And then you find that uh, God's work for mankind's salvation is completed in Revelation 19, one to 21, four, right? So Revelation has this uh, chaotic, uh, chaotic um, structure. Then we find the forces opposing God's people on both sides and you can see in, in the subsection A, um, they are warned. They are warned by the trumpets. The trumpets warn them. And um, the, the next chapter in uh, the, that corresponds is they are punished. Those who oppose God's people are warned in the trumpets. Then they are punished in the seven plagues, right? And then we have in the middle, we have the battle uh, scene in progress with the evil powers. Uh, launching oppre uh, uh, oppression, uh, oppressives, right? They're causing problems for God pe God's people. We find that in 11 through 14, 20, okay? And then we find the battle scenes ended with the evil powers judged. So that is a revelations, chaotic um, structure. We need to understand that well. Okay, now uh, with regard to the, um, the seals, there are three schools of thought, right? Three schools of thought. The first school of thought is the Petrist school of thought. And basically their idea is that the seven seas are describing events that took place in history of the early, um, history of the early Roman empire, the Jewish nation, right? So in other words, all of the seas were fulfilled 17 to 1800 years ago which has very interesting implications because if the seven seas were fulfilled already, all of them during the period of the Roman empire and during the period of the Jewish nation, then we are dealing simply with history and they really have no present relevance to us. So it's a very serious, uh, it is very serious, the school of thought. Uh, if you embrace this, that when you study the passages in the book of Revelation, you think all of them are uh, preterist. They all happen in the past. Now, the second view is the futurist view, uh, which basically uh, the futurists believe in uh, Revelation 4 verse 1, uh, a voice tells John to come up here. They say that is the rapture of the church. And then they say that after the rapture of the church, then the seven seals will transpire in order. So in other words, the seven seals, uh, all of them are future right, after the rapture of the church. Now, if that is true, then the seven seals have no relevance for us today because they're going to get, uh, they're going to be fulfilled after we have gone to heaven, 
right? That's that's the second school of thought. So um, what the devil has done here is through the Petrist and through the futurist schools, he's trying to convince people that these things have no relevance for us today. And if they have no relevance for us today, people won't spend time studying it. It will become uh, not necessary, okay? It will just become interesting, a re interesting read. Now the Petrist say all finished in the past, it's history. So, okay, it might be academically interesting to study, to know, you know, what transpired in history, but it has no present relevance. And for those who believe that the seals are future after the rapture of the church, then the seals have no re relevance for them either, because supposedly we are going to be gone when the seven seals occur, right? So are you understanding this point? If, if, uh, if that's the case, even the, then why bother studying the book of Revelation, especially the seven seals. But the seven seals, according to the third school of thought, the historicist school, have very much relevance for us today. The historicist uh, school teaches that the introductory vision, that is Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, describe the arrival of Jesus to his father at his ascension, right, at the ascension. Now that is very important. Uh, the, 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 this is very important, the chronology, right? In other words, the visions of Revelation four and five. Now in Revelation chapter five, the father is sitting on his throne. If you take time to read it, it'll be good if we uh, read that. There are 24 elders, four living creatures, seven lamps of fire, which represent the entity of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in his entity. And we find that Jesus isn't there. Yet the angelic hosts aren't there either, right? If you read chapter Revelation chapter four uh, carefully, then in chapter five you find Jesus arrives. He's he's um, he's referred to there. He's the Lamb that has been slain, so he's coming immediately after his resurrection. He presents his wounds to the Father. His Father accepts the sacrifice, and he begins his intercessory ministry in the holy place of the sanctuary. So for the historicist school, the seals begin with the ascension of Christ. That's the introductory vision. And then the seven seals are the events that transpire from that point where Jesus begins his intercessory ministry until the second coming of Jesus, just like the seven churches were, right? Now, in other words, the seals describe the events that take place between Christ's inauguration and consummation when he comes. So, so you can follow in the seals the sequence of historical events. It's kind of like, like I said, the seven churches, kind of like the seven trumpets, right? So that's why I said the seven churches were foundational. When you understand the seven churches, which we now understand because we follow this, the series, then we, we, we can build on it the seals and the trumpets that become easy to understand. Like, like, I, like I mentioned before, Daniel 2, right? Daniel 2 began in the days when Daniel wrote, and it concludes at the end, at the second coming of Jesus. So basically the seals have much re relevance because we can follow the historical tra trajectory. And I believe that now we are living in the second part of the sixth seal. We will, we will, when we study that, we will realize that according to times and events that are taking place, we can very clearly say that we are in the second part of the sixth seal. And soon the events of the sixth seal are going to come to a conclusion and Jesus is going to come and then the seventh seal is going to take place, right? Second seal, seventh seal is the second coming of Jesus. So we can follow the flow of history and we can know that everything has been fulfilled the way God has said that it is going to be fulfilled. And we know exactly where we are and what still needs to be fulfilled, right? So I hope that is clear because the, the, that's the beauty of the historicist method of interpreting Bible prophecy, which we as Seventh-day Adventists use that for our her hermeneuticals. That is a, a method of um, scriptural interpretation, the historicist view. Right, so preterists are past, futurists are in the future, but we believe in a historical flow method. 
Now let's discuss the historical flow method, the principles of this method, which is very important for us when we are going to study the seven seals, right? Now, why? Because uh, it's very important to interpret the, um, to, to follow this flow, uh, because the Bible doesn't explain the seven seals. There are no ex explanation of the symbols of the seven seals in Revelation chapter four through verse eight, um, through chapter eight, verse one. We won't find anywhere in Revelation chapter seven where you have, see the, the, have the seal. Uh, it doesn't say the seal is a Sabbath. It doesn't tell you that the, uh, what the trees are. It doesn't tell you what the sea is. It doesn't explain the symbols, okay? So how do you understand the symbols of the seals? You apply the historicist principle that the Bible is its own interpreter, right? You go to other texts in the Bible that use the same symbol to understand what the symbol means because the Bible explains symbols everywhere, right? So you will find, for example, in Revelation chapter seven, it says that the winds, uh, the wind doesn't blow on any tree, right? Now, you are, now we are not going to look for a place where there are lots of trees. No, trees symbolize, when you go to the Bible, symbolize God's people. And there are, uh, are multiple verses that compare, that you can compare that with. He will be like a tree planted by the waters, right? Then uh, it says in Psalms 1. So you know that trees represent God's people. So the winds of strife will not blow on God's people. That's what the Bible is saying. Now seas, uh, well, we know what the seas represent. It represents multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. But you have to go to other places in scripture that give you the meaning of that symbol, right? So the Bible we find is its own interpreter. And that's the principle that we are going to apply to the seals. We are going to use the Bible to interpret, right? We are going to allow other texts of the Bible to explain, explain the meaning of each symbol. Now, I was in my devotions, not yesterday, the day before I found this and I put it here. It's, it's from our high calling page 207. It says, the Bible is its own interpreter with beautiful simplicity. One portion connects itself with the truth of another portion until the whole Bible is blended in one harmonious whole. Light flashes forth from one text to illuminate, uh, to illuminate some portion of the word that seems more obscure, right? So we are going to use the Bible as its own interpreter. Now, the other point is that we need to carefully consider the events, uh, the order of events or the literary structure, literary structure. That's why I spent time explaining the literary structure a little. We are going to uh, uh, explain that a little bit more now. Uh, Realize if we realize if you understand that the literary structure of revelation is tricky. Uh, well, I shouldn't have said that word, but if you think you're going to read Revelation verse chapter one, verse one through Revelation chapter 22, the last verse, and say, I found uh, I'm going to find an exact chronology of all the events that are going to take place from Revelation 1 through the end time, you're going to be confused, so confused you won't know on which planet you are, because Revelation is not written chronologically. Actually, the Bible also is written in cycles if you take time to study, uh, because the book of Revelation is like Daniel, right? Even Daniel is written in cycles. It goes to flashbacks, it goes to forwards, it goes backwards, it repeats itself, it has cycles, and the key is uh, to be able to determine where a cycle ends and where a new cycle begins, right? Now, this is what we're going to spend time on uh, today so we can understand this, um, this uh, principle clearly when we are going to study the uh, seals, right? So it, this is an important point, so we find uh, in Revelation, as in uh, Daniel, it works in cycles. It goes to flashbacks. All of a sudden, then it will go forwards. Then it will go backwards again. Then it will repeat. And then it goes in cycles, right? So the key is to determine where a cycle ends, where a new cycle begins. So we're going to see that in the seals. And it is a very, very important point. So the historicist principle means they're going to take a look 
at the literary structure of the seals as well. Now it's vitally important to realize that the introductory verses, the verses that introduce the seals, they contain the beginning and end point of the entire series. Did you understand? Now the, the introductory verse in, in Revelation that introduces the seals, it contains the beginning point and it contains the ending point of that entire series of the uh, of, of what we are going to study right now we're going to uh, spend a little time here because this is very crucially important right so when the seal begins you have an introductory verse or some sometimes two or three verses that give you the beginning and end points of the um of this series of the series of the of the uh, churches or the seals or the trumpets right so the historicist principle means that we're going to take a look at the literary structure as well, right? Now let's begin. Uh, uh, like I said, bring your Bible, look at your Bible, make a note on your Bible, right? So that you can remember. Of course, I have it up here, but when you see it, you will be able to um, understand it better, right? Um, we, we are going to study a couple of verses from the Bible and we are going to understand uh, uh, this concept where it has the beginning of the series and the end of the series in the introductory verse. Now let's go to Revelation 3, 21, right? Uh, we will uh, pick on this a bit later, but let's just do it now briefly. Um, this is the conclusion to the seven churches. And it's also, it concludes the seven churches and it's also the introduction to the seven seals. It's wow. giving you two points of time with several events in between. Someone likes to read that? This is Jesus speaking. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Okay, so now what are the two points here? Jesus overcame and he sat with his father in his father's throne. Then he says, if you overcome, you will also sit with Jesus on Jesus' throne, on his throne. So you have Jesus overcoming and sitting on the throne. And if we overcome, we will sit on the throne. What are we going to, uh, what are we going to notice is that the seven seals are simply describing the period between when Jesus sat with his father, as I also overcame and sat on my father's throne right? That is when Jesus overcame and he sat on his father's throne. He became, uh, he began his intermediary um, work, right? And then it says, to him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit on my father's throne. So there is this much in, in between that, um, that verse of Revelation, when Jesus sat on his throne and when we will overcome and we will sit with Jesus, which is at the second coming, right? So in other words, the seven seals describe the overcoming of God's people throughout the course of Christian history, culminating with sitting with Jesus on his throne. Now, is that clear? Did you understand that? Now, many times when we read this, we don't understand it because we are just reading what is there. But it says, but what he's saying is, its beginning point is when Jesus sits on his throne, that is, uh, um, uh, this, the, and the seals begin when he starts his work in the holy place in the sanctuary. And it ends when we have overcome and we sit with him on his throne. So in this one verse, gives the starting point of the seals that when Jesus sat with him on with his father in his throne and he gives you the end point when after the seal after the seals God's people are victorious and they sit with Jesus on his throne so the introductory verse is extremely important as you can see right so for us to understand it we need to understand that structure is was that clear yeah. Okay, now let's notice another introductory passage in Revelation chapter 8. Now Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 ends the seals and Revelation 8, 2 to 5 begins the, um, uh, the, the seven trumpets, right? So let's read that and then let's break out and see where the 
um, beginning point is and where the end point is and what is in between. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Now, in the trumpets, the trumpets is a very important series because uh, many, even of our, even in our Adventist church theologians, have got it a bit confused, right? Uh, some of some believe that the trumpets have a dual application, right? Uh, which is which is not biblical. We will find, right? So they're saying some, they were fulfilled and they're going to be fulfilled in the future. Uh, so we, we will do that study on the trumpets after we finish this, right? So we find, uh, going into this, we find, um, now at, let me ask you, up to this point, is the door of probation open? Like Auntie Cruz was reading. How do we know whether the, uh, the, the door of probation is open? because we find that another angel is given the golden censer and came and stood at the altar, right? And he was given much incense that he should offer the prayers of the saints. So if the prayers of the saints are going up to Jesus for, for um, intercession, uh, then, then it means uh, that uh, the, the, the probation hasn't closed. We, our prayers can still go before the Father. Right, so th that is the beginning point. Given a golden censer and stood between before the altar. That's the beginning point of the uh, the trumpets when Jesus begins his uh, ministry in the holy place. Right now, when did Jesus begin his ministry? Begin his intercession, intercession, intercession for us when he ascended to heaven. Right, that's why we are going to study. Uh, Revelation chapters four and five, so that is that becomes clear in our minds, right? So when he uh, when he um, ascended to heaven at the beginning of the Christian dispensation, then the scene changes, and in verse five, the we find then he was given much incense, and then smoke uh, prayers ascended, uh, God from then we find in verse five, then the angel took the censer. Right, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. What does that represent? If the rep if the censer represents the pairs of the saints presented before the Father, what would throwing down the censer represent? It would represent the fact that intercession has ceased. Now, when God has the censer in his hand, intercession is still taking place. But when the, uh, the, when the angel, angel is representing Jesus, angel is messenger, right? We have studied that. So when the angel throws down the censer, that means in, intercession has ceased and probation closes. So the starting point is when the, um, when the angel uh, takes, has this golden censer in his hand, with much incense and he presents it. So that is the starting point. So where did that starting point happen? When Jesus ascended. Then we find the end point. He throws it to the earth when probation closes, right? So then intercession ceases. Now what happens in between when Jesus begins his intercession and when intercession closes? In between what happens is the trumpets. The seven trumpets are in between. Right, so this is the introduction to the seven trumpets. So the seven trumpets give, uh, John gives us a starting point when Jesus ascends to heaven and he gives us the end point is when probation closes, right? So in this introductory vision gives you the starting and the ending point, right? So we have Jesus begins his intercession 
uh, as soon as he uh, ascends, then intercession ends when he clasps the censer to the, to the ground. And in between you find the seven trumpets, right? There are noises, thunders, uh, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So that is the seven trumpets. Okay, is that clear? Do you, do, can you clearly see the beginning point, the end point, and in between what is there? So, he, so studying the structure of revelation becomes very important. Just reading it, we wouldn't understand. What does it mean? So now we know that there is a beginning because we can clearly identify what the um, golden sensor is. We, we go back. Uh, we know it began then. We know when he uh, casts his, um, uh, the sensor down, he says, let the uh, let the what um, the righteous be righteous, and the, the, that is when Jesus' perversion closes, right? In Revelation, so that is the end of this uh, of the trumpets. In between, you find the trumpets. So then we are going to try, find the trumpets in between that, right? So that's the in in between one. Then let's go to another one. This this one in Revelation, I learned fifteen to seven. Uh, in 17 is a bit more complex, but if you understand the, the, um, the, the, the what is it, the mathematical equation, the, the way it is done, right? Uh, it, it, you will be able to clearly see it, right? So uh, Revelation 11, now this is the conclusion of the seven trumpets. Now remember, we started the beginning of the seals, then we went to the trumpets. Now this is the uh, end, the close uh, ending or the conclusion of the seven trumpets in chapter 11, uh, verse 15, right? Uh, and this is where you're going to see what we really need to be careful about when studying the sequence or order of events. It says there in Revelation um, 11, beginning with verse 15, someone likes to read that. Then the seventh. Sorry, Auntie. You read, Auntie. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of this world have become." Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ." And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying. Okay, now notice the hymn, the theme, theme of the hymn that they are going to sing. Let's read. Go ahead, Andy, read. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Mm. So when, uh, when the seven uh, trumpets end, right? So what, when, when does Jesus begin to reign? Well, he actually begins to reign when probation closes because his kingdom is complete, right? Uh, the investigative judgment has revealed who are the subjects of his kingdom and his kingdom are his subjects, right? So when the investigative judgment ends, his kingdom is made up. However, Jesus does not take over the reins of the kingdom until his second coming. But legally, the verdict is already there when probation closes because uh, his kingdom, the group of his followers, have been identified and they have made they make up uh, they are they are gone they are, he, he it is made up right his kingdom is made up by the investigative judgment then we find that they go through a time of trouble where it appears that satan is in control now ellen white says that after the close of probation satan will have full control over the impenitent or the wicked so it would appear that Satan is in control, even though Jesus has legally taken over the kingdom. Now, Satan is struggling to keep his kingdom. But then after the tribulation, Jesus empirically and personally takes the kingdom, right? So that is what it says, right? So we find that the kingdoms of the world of Jesus, he reigns forever. And then the song is that Jesus reigns after the seven 
trumpets are ended. So the seven trumpet, seventh trumpet deals with the close of probation and with Jesus taking over his kingdom, right? And in, in verse 17, the seventh trumpet ends when Jesus reigns. Right, so the seventh trumpet is when Jesus reigns. Is it clear? Are you are you getting a clear picture? It all begins when Jesus ascends. In between are the um, trumpets. We are going to see. We are going to see uh, how um, how where the trumpets are fitting in when we study that. Right, but right now we'll do the seals. So now the tricky part is verse eighteen. Now, if you read verse 18, immediately after verse 17, where Jesus um, uh, begins to reign, you're going to be all messed up. Because what verse 18 does, it gives you the structure of the rest of the book of uh, Revelation. Right? So Revelation 17 ends with, the, with Jesus reigning, taking over his kingdom. But if you read Revelation uh, chapter 11, verse 18, it's going to give you the structure of the rest of the book of Revelation, right? So it's introducing the main sections of the last half of the book of Revelation. Now you say, how is that? Let's go and look at it. Let's read it first. Let's read Revelation 11 verse 18. Now we, 17 says he reigns. And now if you are reading Revelation 17 verse 18 immediately after it, you're going to be confused. Let's read it and see. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightning, lightning noises, thundering, and earthquakes, and great hail. Now, won't you get confused? Now, in, in uh, verse 17, Jesus uh, takes up his kingdom to reign. And then all of a sudden, verse 18 talks about nations are angry, your wrath has come, uh, the time of the dead should be judged. So you will get confused, right? Because this verse mentions so many several events, right? First of all, is the nations are angry. Now, when it says nations were angry, who are they angry at? See, this doesn't mean that they're just mad at each other. It means that they're angry at whom? They're angry at God. They're angry at God's people, right? The nations are not just mad with each other. They're angry at God and they're angry at God's people. Then it says there, your wrath has come. Now, uh, let me ask you, what is God's wrath? Remember, we have studied this before. Where is God's wrath poured out? God's wrath is poured out without mercy and mingled. Seven last plagues. Yes, Santi, the seven last plagues. Now, is this before or after the close of probation? This is before the close of probation. But verse 17, we finish. Jesus has uh, the probation closed and Jesus is reigning. So you get kind of Sorry, Auntie. Okay. So uh, the, 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 you will get confused, right? Um, now it says, now, now the, then, then it talks about. Uh, the judgment, the dead, they shall be judged. Now, didn't there, wasn't there an investigative judgment before the seven plagues? Maybe this judgment is not talking about the investigative judgment because the investigative judgment finishes before the seven, seven plagues fall. So then this yeah. judgment has to be the judgment talking about a uh, millennium judgment, right? So can when the, the cases of the cases of the wicked hello decided okay cases of the wicked are being uh, decided right so it says once again the nations are angry what's happening now 
during this is happening the nations are angry during probationary period angry at god's people right then your wrath has come that's god's response to the anger of the nations right um and the time of the death that sh they should be judged that the that you should reward your saints, the prophets and the saints, those who fear your name, both great and small, should be destroyed and those who destroy the earth. So you see, um, you have in this section, you have five events. The nations were angry, which is happening now, which is going to intensify at the point where you will have a Sunday law and the death decree. Then you have the wrath has come. That's God's response to the anger of the nations against his people after the close of probation, when the seven last plagues fall. And then the time of judgment of the um, dead uh, and the time to reward God's servants and the time to destroy those who destroyed the earth is after that, right? So let's see. We find immediately after chapter 7, we notice Revelation 12 through 14 describes the anger of the nations. So in other words, there is an amplification of that phrase, the nations were angry. Revelation 12 tells us the dragon went to kill the man child. The dragon persecutes the woman for 1,600 years. The dragon was angry at the remnant of a seed who keep the commandments of God. So this is the nations are angry, right? So this is what uh, Revelation um, 11 verse 18 was talking about. Then if you go to Revelation 13, right? Uh, we, find, um, we find in Revelation 12, the central theme is the anger of the nations against God and his people. Now, Revelation 13, you have the beast that receives power, uh, and throne and authority from the dragon. The dragon is a Roman empire, the same empire that wanted to kill Jesus in the, uh, chapter 12. And then you have the beast that receives power and the throne to persecute God's people for 1,260 years. And then a beast rises from the earth that gives a decree that you can't buy or sell. And whoever doesn't receive the mark of the beast is going to be killed. Now, is that the anger of uh, anger again, anger of the nations? Yes, the nations are angry, right? So that's absolutely true. Now, Revelation 14, when the three angels' messages are proclaimed, then you have the wicked gathering around Jerusalem. Uh, then you get the wine press in Revelation 14. We want they want to destroy those who are within the city because they have accepted the messages of the three angels. And so the central themes of Revelation 12, 13, and 14 is the anger of the nations against God's people, right? So that is, is it summarized in that one phrase that introduces the second half of the book. Now, are you, are you following me that, that all those three um, are there in this one phrase, the nations were angry, which is introducing the second half of Revelation um the book of revelation right then you had the phrase then your wrath has come now where would uh, where would that be described right well it would be described in the next section after verse 14 right in the last half of a revelation chapter so we will we have chapter 14 then chapter we find in chapter 15 through 19 it speaks about the close of probation. It says there that the temple was filled with smoke. That's the heavenly temple, which refers to the most holy place. No one can enter the temple until the seven last plagues have been poured out. So that's a close of probation. And the seven last plagues are God's wrath, complete wrath for the entire world, right? Now the trumpets are God's wrath, but it is not for the entire world. It is in certain places, right? We are going to find that out. So this is God's wrath unmingled with mercy in the seven last plagues that fall through. So Revelation uh, 15 through 19 explains, is, is an amplification of that phrase, then your wrath has come, right? Close of probation, seven last plagues, all of that section deals with the wrath of God. Is that clear? So the nations were angry, 12, 13, 14, 15, your wrath has come, 15 through 19, which talks about close approbation and the last plagues. Then in Revelation 20, we have this um, time to judge the dead, 
right? Well, if you are following the chronological order, uh, which dead is this talking about judging? It's not talking about the investigative judgment of God's people before the second coming because of the plagues. Once the plagues are flowed out, probation has closed. Is that clear? Yeah. Hmm. So it must have to refer to another investigation, right? Another judgment. Uh, other dead people who are going to be judged. And who would those be? They, that would be the wicked people who remained on earth and who are being judged during the millennium. Remember the uh, living uh, wicked die and the wicked dead are not resurrected, right? So that is the millennium judgment that you find in Revelation chapter 20, right? Revelation chapter says that the judgment was committed to those who were beheaded because they did not worship the beast, his image, and receive his mark, right? So the time to judge the dead is not the righteous dead. It is the time to judge the wicked dead who have been left here on earth at the second coming. Now, is that clear? Can you see the sequence, the chronological flow of uh, revelation? But you need to understand where it begins and where it ends, right? And then, he, and then he, it says, at the same time, God rewards his people. Now, when he begins the judgment of the wicked, he has also rewarded his people, right? He does that, right? God rewards his people. Um, Jesus takes his people to heaven, rewards them with heaven, and the judgment of the wicked begins. Now, this is during the millennium. Now, that would be the last section of Revelation. Um, of, uh, of the book of Revelation, right? Uh, when, uh, when the wicked are destroyed, so in other words, uh, they are destroyed, uh, they who destroy the earth and themselves destroyed after their judge. So we have there in Revelation uh, 20, 14 to 15, that then death and Hades. We know Hades is the grave. We did a study on that. Uh, were cast into the lake of fire. Death is our enemy, right? So death is cast into the fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So then that is there. Uh, the reward, God's people are rewarded with heaven and eternal life. The wicked are given their reward, which is e eternal death, right? So Revelation 11 verse 18 is actually a summary of the second half of the book of Revelation, the main events. So you cannot read Revelation as, as you would read the story of Esther or the story of Ruth. If you read Revelation like that, you're going to get totally confused, right? So that is why it's very important to study the structure. Now, Mrs. White, um, we're going to read this statement. Uh, Mrs. White, I don't think, sat down and studied the literary structure of the trumpets, but she did receive divine revelation, right? She was inspired in her writings. So she presented everything exactly the way it is. It is. She had no PhD, no super studying, but all the scholars, no Ellen White writes everything right because she was inspired by God. She put everything in proper in its proper order. Let's read this statement and then we will understand that how the Holy Spirit inspired her to write. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided. Read, Auntie. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided, either for salvation or destruction, and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire, and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance. Then Jesus will step out from between the Father and man, and God will keep silence no longer, but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up 
and that the time of trouble such as never was had not yet commenced the nations are now getting angry but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary he will stand up put on the garments of vengeance and then the seven last plagues will be poured out mm. isn't that clear so revelation uh, chapter 11 verse 18 is in chronological order it, i do you agree with me yes or no hmm. yes Yes. So according to Mrs. White, they're in chronological order. Absolutely. Right. Now, the question is, when uh, Mrs. White says, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God and the time of ju to judge the dead was separate and distinct. So it is the time to judge the dead after the close of probation, according to that statement. Right. So how we interpreted Revelation 11, 18 was uh, Correct, because Mrs. White was seen, seen, she saw this and it was made clear to us. So the nation's angry, first of all, then the wrath of God, which is the seven last plagues come. And then the time to judge the dead happens during the thousand year millennium pre period. So, the, so this investigative judgment is not of the righteous. It cannot be because um, uh, we know we, we know chronologically it doesn't happen because probation has to close before the plagues fall. So it has to be the judgment of the wicked. And Mrs. White um, ratifies it. She may, may, makes us understand it more clearly. Now, the anger of the nation represents the anger of the wicked against God's people. Just to go over it again, God's wrath being poured out is the seven last plagues. And the judgment of the dead is not the judgment of the righteous dead. It is a judgment of the wicked dead, right? Now she ends her statement by saying, I saw the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead was separate and distinct. So they are separate and distinct events, right? One following the other. So it's chronological, right? Uh, and also that Michael had not stood up and at the time uh, and at the time of trouble such as was had not yet commenced right so notice the chronological details are you clear right mm. right so we are clear on that right so mrs white uh, also had that she clarifies the chronological order of the uh, of the of revelation 11 18 okay now now i I want us to notice uh, how important this issue of where yes. the new series begins and where the new series ends. Now, listen, we can interpret symbols until we are blue in our faces. But if we don't know how revelation is organized, how the events, what sequence of events is, when one series ends, when once the next series begins, when there is a flashback, when, when it takes you forward, we are going to we are, we are not going to even know where we are at. That's why Revelation is not a book that you can just read and think you know. Revelation is for some people, for someone to sit and study like we are doing, right? So more important, but just as important as being able to interpret individual symbols, what they mean and put, it, put them together, it's crucially important to know how the book of Revelation was organized, the sequence of events, how the book is uh, uh, organized into its cycles, right? So let's read. Now, this is immediately after verse 18. Um, we're going to read uh, uh, Revelation 19. And if you are going to read Revelation 11 in chronological order, you're going to be, it doesn't make much sense. Let's read verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightning, noises, thundering, on earth, earthquake, and great hail. Now, will you, will you not be confused if you read verse 19 immediately after 18? If you read 18 immediately after 17, can you see? It takes you to the future, it brings you back, right? So, so Revelation 19 is talking about um, taking place after Revelation 11 verse 18. Are you going, aren't we, will we not be in serious trouble? 
Now, Revelation 19 is the introductory verse to the rest of the book. Verse 18 gives you all the summary of the events. So it summarizes, and then 19 gives you the starting point of the last half, um, and that is the beginning of the investigative judgment in 1844, right? So it, it begins the last half of the book. But if you're going to read 17, 18, and 19 together, you're going to be confused, or you will not even bother to understand it because it goes over your head, right? Because Revelation 11, 19 applies to 1844. But we have already uh, in 18 gone to heaven and uh, the, uh, are judging the uh, wicked. Can you see? Can you see Revelation cycles? Is is it clear? Right. So if you read Revelation 11, 19 in chronological sequence with the verse that comes before, you will we will all be goofed up, right? So when you realize that Revelation 19 is the introduction to the last half of the book, that focus is going to be uh, the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, then it makes sense because this is talking about the heavenly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary is open and the Ark of the Covenant is seen. That means it is talking about the uh, beginning of the investigative judgment in 1844. Now, can you understand Revelation, the sequence of jumping here, going back, flashbacks, um, going forward, coming back, uh, rep repetition, and then in cycles, right? So uh, when um, this now 1844 happens, now investigative judgment in he heaven, uh, when that concluded at the seventh plague, right? Which we are not going to read now, but where you have lightning. Remember we had lightnings, noises, thunders, and earthquake and great hail. So how important then is it to understand re that revelation is not written in chronological order. Now, the one chapter that is written in chronological order in the Bible is Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is in strict chronological order when Jesus gave them the end time events. You read that and see, it is in strict chron chronological order. But revelation is not in chronological order, right? You know the reason why the Christian world is so goofed up because they use the wrong method. They're trying to open the door with the wrong key. Only the historicist method will help people unlock the secrets of the book of Revelation. So there is no other method that will do it, nor does it, right? So that is why we use the historicist method uh, to understand it's relevant and understandable, okay? Now prophecies method, the last point that we want to deal with in this introductory aspect is that, uh, that, uh, that sometimes we are very incons inconsistent in our way of interpreting prophecies of the book of Revelation. And for a moment, I'm going to mention something about the seven trumpets, which I said we will study later on, God willing. The seven trumpets which, co uh, which cover Revelation chapter eight, verse two through Revel uh, Revelation, uh, the end of um, uh, chapter 11, there are different views of the trumpet, right? Now, even in our church, right? So that's why I want to speak to us very clearly. Some say that the trumpets are totally future. Some say the trumpets are all in the past. Some say that there are, the trumpets have a dual application. They were fulfilled in the past and they're going to be fulfilled in the future. But the, peep, the reason why people have all these different views is because they are very inconsistent in the methods that they use. Now, let's go through some of the things. The inconsistency of method. Now, the, uh, now the prophetic series all begins with what? When you have a prophetic sequence, they always begin in the day in which the prophet wrote. Now, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, all took place in the time, in the year, in when uh, the prophet Daniel wrote it, and Revelation began when John wrote it, during his time, right? So the prophetic um, series always begins uh, in the day when the, prof the prophet who was writing it was living, 
right? So the uh, then prophecy's method begins in the day when the prophet wrote, concludes, prophecy concludes when God sets up his eternal kingdom, everlasting kingdom. And the middle portion flows without any interpretation or parenthesis. You know exactly where we are in the flow of history and where things are leading. Now, chain prophecies of um, Daniel. Let me give you as an example. Where does Daniel 2 begin? It began, began in Babylon. Did Daniel live in Babylon? Yes. Daniel 2 began in Babylon. Was Daniel living in Babylon? Yes. Daniel 8 began during the Medo-Persian era, and Daniel lived during that period of Medo-Persia, right? Daniel 11 begins in Medo-Persia, and Daniel was alive in Medo-Persia <coughs> at the time. <coughs> so once again, when does the prophetic uh, chain begin? begins in the time when the prophet wrote. Now, how about Revelation? Revelation chapter 12, uh, you find the dragon there tries to kill the man child. Now, is that during the time of John? Right, during the time of John? Was Jesus, did the devil try to kill Jesus during the time of John? Yes, yeah. as a baby, right? Then yeah. Daniel 13, the dragon gives his throne, his power, his authority to the beast. Now the dragon we know is the Roman Empire, right? So you're starting at the Roman Empire again. And then you have the seven churches. Where did the seven churches begin? They began during the apostolic time, right? During uh, John's, uh, John's time, right? So where did the seals begin? The white horse begins during the apostolic time, right? So prophetic, the prophecy's method is, Begins in the day when the prophet wrote, concludes when God sets up his everlasting kingdom. The middle portion flows without any interpretation or parenthesis means without any break, uh, any um, uh, cuts in between. And you know exactly where you are in the flow of history, where these things are leading, right? Now, dual application of chain prophecies. Now, this is another problem that we have. If any of you have read Uriah Smith, um, you know, Uriah Smith was one of our founders, but Uriah Smith was not accurate on the trumpets, right? He, Uriah Smith begins the trumpets in the fourth century with the barbarian invasions. Now, can you see an inconsistency there? All of the prophetic chains begin with in the days when the prophet lived, right? So then Uriah Smith is starting his, his starting the uh, trumpets in the uh, during the time of the Barbary invasions, right? So that is it's not consistent with the prophetic methods of the Bible, right? Uh, and the uh, trumpets are no exception, right? The trumpets began not in the first century according to him, but began in the fourth with the Barbary invasions, right? So there is this problem. Furthermore, uh, that chain prophecies have dual applications. Do the seven churches have a dual application to the past and to the future? We just finished the seven churches. Do they have an application to the past and the future? They have just one application flowing through from apostolic times till the end, right? So they don't have a dual application. They have just one application, a historicist method. Now, does Daniel chapter seven have a dual application? Can you say that Daniel seven is, is fulfilled twice? A dual application means fulfilled twice, once in the past, and then it's going to be fulfilled in the future again. No, because Daniel chapter seven flows chronologically, right? Um, does Revelation 13 have a dual application? Does it have, uh, um, uh, is it fulfilled twice? No. So why should we say that the seven trumpets have a dual application of fulfillment if none of the other chain prophecies have dual application? Okay, Daniel 2 also has one fulfillment, 
right? If you use the historicist method, it helps you know exactly where you are at any given moment in the study of prophecy when you follow that trajectory. Now, it begins with the head uh, of gold, breasts and arms of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and the stone that hits the image. So we are in the, uh, the, the, the feet of iron and clay, right? We, we know where we are. Right, so it doesn't have a. It it wasn't fulfilled in the past, and it won't be fulfilled. The all the these kingdoms are not going to be fulfilled twice in the future, right? So it has a um, historicist flow. So they, Daniel two also cannot have a dual fulfillment. Seven no dual fulfillment because um, the lion represents Babylon. Babylon. Um, uh, is uh, the bear represents uh, Medo Persia? They are all they are all past, right? So you cannot have them in the future. Now, what most Christians do is they call the bear Russia and uh, that kind of thing. That is not biblical, right? Now, chain prophecies you we have it goes from lion Babylon to bear Medo Persia to leopard Greece dragon. A beast which is uh, imperial Rome, the ten horns, the division of Rome, and then you get the little horn and so on. So you get this very clear flow, right? So that is so there is no reason why the trumpet should have a dual application, right? Now, um, uh, now I'm, I'm spending time on this because many of us have studied. Um, when we have done studies on Daniel and Revelation, we they, that has been taught to us before. Have you, are, are you are aware of it, right? Furthermore, the so that is why I want to clear it in our minds that there is just a single application, right? Now the, uh, the John would not uh, dedicate four trumpets to the barbarian invasions, right? Now, the barbarian invasions are important, but four trumpets to barbarian in invasions, I don't think by, um, by any stretch of imagination, John is going to uh, dedicate four trumpets to them. Now, in some, some explanations for the trumpets, they even give specific names, right? They say Muhammad, Odo, Es, Attila, the Han, Right, so nowhere in prophecy do you get individual names fulfilled, their movements and their kingdoms that fulfill Bible prophecy, right? Now, this is something that I even learned before till I understood it uh, the way I'm understanding it now, right? So the, the further, further what we need to understand is that in the trumpets you find inconsistency in applying the symbols of the trumpet. You will find a different method uh, is applied to interpret the symbols of the trumpet than what is used to in interpret the symbols of the passages of the Bible, right? So you read, for example, some books on the seven trumpets, some Adventist books, right? And they'll do something like they will interpret the symbols literally, right? A star fell from heaven, right? That, and sometimes they interpret it symbolically. So there appears to be really no method, right? No hermeneutical method to interpret it, right? So we need to get to understand it clearly, right? Um, that um, that, uh, that uh, as Adventists, we understand that the symbols before the second coming, right? Uh, so let me say all chain prophecies have only one historical fulfillment. Is that clear? All chain prophecies have only one historical fulfillment. And symbols before the second coming are symbolically interpreted. They are not interpreted literally, right? Now in uh, the Old Testament, things are literal. But in the New Testament, till the close of probation, uh, prophecy is symbolic. But after the close of probation, you get literal time. Right? So all the symbols before the close of probation have to be interpreted symbolically. Okay? I hope that it, that makes sense to you all. Now they talk about Muslims. Have you heard that? Have you heard Muslims in the trumpets? No? No. Didn't hear Ambix? 
No. Yes, we heard. Yes, I have studied with you. When we say Muhammad, then the, uh, they came like um, this. Um, we had fifth and sixth trumpets. Right. Now, this is where we clear that down. One final point that we have on this series is the trumpets is the Muslims' fulfillment for the, particularly for the fifth and sixth trumpets, right? Now, the big question is, where do you find Muslims in any of the chain prophecies? Are Muslims in Daniel 2? Mm -hmm. No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 7? No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 8 and 9? No. No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 11? No. Are the Muslims in uh, the seven churches? No. no. Are the Muslims in Revelation 12? No. Mm -hmm. Are the Muslims in Revelation um, uh, in the seven seals? No. 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 So are the Muslims in Revelation 13? No. no. So, so they appear nowhere in any of the prophetic chain. So why would there be a great emphasis in the trumpet series for the role of the Muslims? The Adventists, some Adventists do teach this. That is why I'm stressing. I have studied it like that. And I have tried to understand it that way. Till I went to this series and Pastor Bo explained it so clearly, right? So these are questions that we need to ask ourselves when we study the trumpets, right? We are going to look at that in detail when we do it. But basically, these are things that we need to clear for ourselves. Are they in this? Are they in that? No. So the Muslims are not mentioned anywhere. When you, when you understand the trumpet series, you will understand it better, right? So now that cleared the structural one. Um, now we, what we want to do is we want to, I want to just share with you some introductory vision, simple points uh, to what we are going to study, right? Mm, the introductory vision uh, of Revelation 4 simply points to Jesus's ascension to heaven and his inauguration as the interceding high priest, right? We need to look at some events that transpired while Jesus was on earth. Now, first of all, we need to notice that Jesus is the creator. And because he is the creator, he is responsible for our existence. Is this a true statement? Yes. Yes. Because he's our creator, he's responsible for our existence. He's not responsible for our sins. He's responsible for our existence because he's our creator. Let's read John 1, verses 1 to, two, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, that he is Jesus, the Word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Okay. So who was the creator of all things? Jesus. Yes. Now, did Jesus personally create you and me? Yes. Where did you come from, Ambix? Yes. Jesus created us. Where did you come from, Auntie? You came from your mother. Okay. And your yeah. mother came from her mother. And her mother came yeah. from her mother till we all came from Eve. Adam so and Eve. Yes. So God created Adam and Eve and then we were procreated from them, right? So when Jesus yeah. created Adam and Eve, he created all of us because we all come from them, right? Adam and Eve procreated us. So he is responsible for the existence of every person here on planet Earth because he's our creator, right? Mm. Like uh, parents here are responsible for their children. Now, at the beginning, when Jesus created this world, he placed Adam the original, as the original ruler over this realm. Adam was king. So in other words, um, Adam was uh, the king of the realm of this earth. Now, let's read um, Psalms 8, 3 to 5, uh, which tells us this. Now, we find uh, that one evening David was contemplating the heavens, and then he wrote these words. Let's read that.
Mm. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Okay, now this is talking about Adam, right? Now, who wears crowns? Kings, right? So now every king has a realm of dominion. Uh, so Adam was created to be king of. What? Yeah, let's read verse six. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That means that he is the ruler. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Mm. So God chose Adam as king and his territory was everything relating to planet Earth. So Adam, it was our original uh, king, right? Or, original king for Earth. Now, conditions for rulership. However, there was a condition for him to remain uh, ruler over this realm and that was to offer God sinless perfection. And we all know Adam didn't offer what God required. Therefore, the Bible tells us that Satan usurped the throne that belonged to Adam and the territory which he, which he ruled. Let's read Luke 4, 5 to 7. Then the devil, taking him up on the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give it to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me and I give it to you, uh, give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Mm. So by the time Jesus, Jesus came, there were many kings. It was still the planet earth but there were many kingdoms now this authority uh, that is the that is position right and who delivered this authority to him adam when he sinned so to who took over the thrones of this world satan and this became his realm of dominion his territory of course he usurped it it was not rightfully his he stole it from adam now in romans 6 16 uh, let's read what this says. Do you know, not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are slaves of whom you obey. Mm. So Adam chose to obey Satan. Therefore, he became a slave of Satan. And of course, all his descendants sinned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of Adam's descendants, all of us have become slaves as well. Now man or mankind therefore needed some way to be saved. Now, so, and now remember Jesus is responsible. So Jesus now says, I'm responsible for their existence. They are sin, they are lost, they're going to die, they're going to suffer the second death. I need to implement a plan so that they can recover what was lost, what was rightfully theirs. Now we're going to notice in next week's study that the redeemer of the lost possession and the emancipator of slavery had to be a next of king. He had to be a brother, right? In other words, he had to be a close relation in order to redeem someone. That is how uh, the redemption of in Israel took place, right? I think that is found in um, Exodus 25. If you have time, just read it. Um, someone who sold himself into slavery or someone who had uh, um, sold their pattern, their, 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 their heritage or had hand handed over uh, the territory that they governed could be redeemed only by a next of kin, right? 
um, and the next stock king would uh, uh, recover by making a payment of what had been lost. So a payment had to be made by someone close a, a brother, right? Uh, so that they could claim it back. So we're going to find out that the problem is that within the human race, there was no one who had not sold himself to slavery. And there was no one who had not relinquished their possession because the Bible says we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of Lord, of God, right? So within the human race, there was no one who could re recover uh, the lost possession. But we shall see that someone did show up and became our next of kin to claim back for us that possession. Mm -hmm.